Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited about this. Uh, outside even just doing what I do with the careers, I mean, sorry, with the, with the recruitment and careers, I also do a bit of mentorship um, from my former uni, uh, that's Edinburgh, right? And they, through the MasterCard, so the people who are on MasterCard scholarships um, currently have mentors, right? So I, I do this quite, quite a bit, right? But I'm going to go through sort of what I've been through in my life, how I got to where I got, and maybe give a bit of advice on, you know, in general, how to position yourself, how to, how to stand out and, you know, how to, you know, get ahead. Really. So I spent uh, most of my life in Kampala. Uh, I was born in Kenya. My parents moved back to Uganda when I was about three. And then I went to the UK for my undergraduate degree. I graduated at about 21. I did accounting and statistics in London, in Middlesex. And then I came back, uh, worked with family till I was about 24. Then I went to Edinburgh to do my master's, which I did in finance and investment. And after that, my, my journey into uh, recruitment and jobs sort of started from there. Uh, so just to go into that a little bit, I am the CEO of uh, Brighton Monday Uganda, and Brighton Monday is under a larger group of companies. Um, that's uh, the, the holding company for these particular uh, different marketplaces, digital marketplaces in Africa is called Ringia One Africa Media. And, uh, you know, we're in uh, different verticals, some like cars, uh, jobs, property, and so on. So that company again is is owned by a larger company in switzerland called ringia right that that operates quite a number of job sites uh, across the world so it's it's something i'm very passionate about and i'm fortunate to be in a position where i have support from such an amazing group and what we're doing is um ensuring that we are making it easy to connect uh, people to the right opportunities so from a sort of getting prepared and a life perspective, especially when uh, you're still a teenager, is like you really need to put in the work, right? So you need to start early, you know, have a dream or a vision, a longer term vision, and then set up goals uh, that would sort of be your steps to get to where you want to be in the long term, right? Because it doesn't happen overnight. Um, what that entails is a lot of hard work, a lot of patience, um, a lot of perseverance, but you just have to keep going because life cannot be a straight line, right? So that would be sort of the biggest message I would, I, would, I, would, I would give. The other thing that I think has worked for me quite well is uh, knowing yourself, um, sort of mastering yourself, becoming disciplined, um, developing the right habits, um, having the right outlets for your stress, um, and just generally knowing yourself, what are your limitations, what are not, what weaknesses do you have, how can you work on those weaknesses to make them an opportunity for you to be better, uh, and just entirely knowing who you are and what, what, what um, you can bring to the table where you need to improve. Uh, so yeah, that's what I think uh, up until now has been what I live by and what has enabled me to get to where I've gotten. Um, so really, there's, it's not like there's no like straight path one way to do things right but it's um incremental steps it's uh, building the right habits like i said it's being disciplined being persistent and yeah i think that's really uh um masala that's what that's what um i would say really tell yeah okay. and uh, what about your stories i mean can you share situations that um led you to making those conclusions like um right. how to learn the business okay so, um, so personally, like I, I come from a very high performing background in terms of my family. So I just never had the chance to slack me as me, right? Uh, but in terms of how that drove me was sort of having the right conditions around me to enable me to push myself and push myself um, beyond, right? The other thing is, is I just keep talking about persistence and perseverance from the sense that at each and every time, like I studied accounting and I've never ever practiced 
accounting in my entire life. Like I, I didn't go out to do ACCA or CPA. I was just able to pivot because what happened is that after I finished my, my master's degree, I really wanted to be an investment banker, but the, uh, the, the financial markets in Uganda were very underdeveloped. So I had to start looking for opportunities elsewhere, right? Which is how I ended up in careers and in jobs. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that at the back of my mind, my entire vision from when I was um, a teenager was to be, to like head an organization or to just be in a top management position. That's what I was aiming for from the beginning, right? So when I figured out that one path, say like if I wanted to be an accountant and that path wasn't getting me there as quickly as it as I wanted it to, I was able to pivot pretty quickly, right? But the point I'm trying to make is that I kept it at the back of my mind that I had this long-term goal, right? And the things I did incrementally still evolved around the things I'm speaking about, right? Like just being disciplined, sticking to a goal. And then the other thing that I'm, I'm gonna add to that is being able to pivot as long as, you know, whatever you're doing or whatever you're trying to do is taking you to that true north and that um, destination that you want to go to. I hope I answered you correctly. That's well, great. The, the pivoting is really important because yeah. the, I'm quite sure that what you learn studying accounting is much more than accounting itself, right? It's about yeah. uh, being rigid in your way of thinking, uh, being careful with certain mistakes that could have uh, severe consequences. Yeah. And you have to deconstruct the skill sets that are uh, learning in a way that can be applied in uh, other careers. In fact, if you're the CEO, you kind of need to know a little bit about everything, really. Yeah. And you know, you have certain skills that are so essential and accounting is one of them, like finance in general. You can't yeah. really be a CEO if you can't do finance. Right? You know, yeah, you of course not. Have accountability uh, towards your investors or shareholders uh, without uh, those skills. So the one thing that uh, I would hope that teenagers uh, would uh, get good at uh, as quickly as possible is understanding that everything that they're learning has value. Some things have more value than others, but it really depends on where uh, you're planning to go. But the uh, uh, pivoting decision is uh, quite interesting. So if you could tell us a bit more about uh, the moment when you realize that, okay, I cannot keep on going down the track that I had planned. I have to switch to something else. So when did that happen? And what were the elements that led you into making the decision? Right. Uh, good question. I was actually just thinking about that as you were speaking. So um, I think I graduated in about 2012 after my master's and I got into investment banking for a while. But what happened is that, to be honest with you, it was just completely boring, right? Because in, in Uganda, at least, um, like I said, the financial markets are very underdeveloped. So what would happen is that at work, all we were doing was sort of reinvesting money into uh, government treasuries, right? And um, and uh, and uh, fixed deposit accounts. So it was a very cyclical job and I, I was just getting bored. And so an opportunity came up with uh, Brighter Monday at the time and it was a management position, but it was in marketing, right? So I thought to myself, am I, am I going to completely change? Like, is this the time for me to just let go of like everything I, I was doing before or planning on doing? But on the flip side, it was a management position, right? And I wasn't in, in that position before. So I just figured, man, let me just do it. But back to what you were speaking about, um, how different skills uh, intertwine to help you um, progress, right? So what happened is that when I actually started, uh, when, I, when I got into a marketing career, I figured that like everything I had learned, especially now in the digital era where you have a lot of digital marketing and a lot of things are being measured, what happened is that the analytical skill set and the, the being good with numbers and, and, you know, sort of looking at it from a very analytical perspective, measuring returns, um, measuring how effective things are, and just coming with that thinking of an accountant or, or, or of uh, somebody with a finance background made me much better at my job, right? So um, I guess it's, it's, it's one of those things. I think sometimes, uh, you know, opportunities, opportunities are... What do they say? They say luck is the luck is the is the intersection between opportunity and preparation, right? So if you're preparing yourself day by day to be better, and you get to a point where the opportunity presents itself, I would say just go for it, right? As long as, like I said before, you're sticking to your original um, vision or your original goal for your life, right? 
whichever opportunity comes your way, don't be shy to take risks to pivot, right? Because I, would have, I, would, I wouldn't be a CEO at my age right now if I didn't make that choice at that point, right? And yet at the time, I didn't even, I probably wasn't thinking that far, but this is exactly where it led me. So thinking about it in hindsight, it's, it's, it's again, it's just being prepared for when opportunities come, come through, yeah. And how did that opportunity come your way? Someone identified your profile as a high flyer? Uh, did you have any uh, previous projects related to marketing that got their attention? So how did they notice you? A referral. Someone referred me, which is another thing I'm going to take. Uh, I'll, I'll come into about careers and and growing your profile and um, how you how you package yourself for people to notice you. Right? Is if you're uh, if you continue engaging in conversations like these, right, from an early on age, you keep um, going out to networking events, you keep putting yourself out there and packaging yourself as somebody who's knowledgeable in something, it is inevitable that somebody is going to pick you up or refer you, right? Because that's really how how, how the world works, right? It's really a, a referral-based world, mostly. So yeah, that's that's exactly how it played out. I was I was referred and I, I took it, I just took it on. And... Um... Why did this person took, take the risk, right? Because obviously making a referral, you're betting your reputation, right? You know, if you're yeah. recommending someone who is not very good, clearly people are, will, will stop trusting you very quickly. So what skills did you have in the marketing domain that made the person who did the referral feel comfortable to, to do that? I think, I think actually at the time, the country manager of the company took a, just took a chance with me off of the way I was presenting myself or the way that I was understanding things from a holistic level, right? Because like I'm in the job market and it's not always, um, it's not, unless you're doing something extremely technical, like I don't know, engineering, right? It's not always the case that, uh, that you have to have a particular set of skills to do a job, right? Majority of the time, even as a manager, the biggest thing I look out for is somebody's attitude um, ability to learn, right? Ability to pivot, agility. Those are the kind of things I look for when I'm hiring, for example, right? So I, you could find somebody who has all the skill set in the world, but they can't be, they can't work in a team, for example, right? So it's 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 packaging. How you package yourself, how you present yourself, the kind of rooms you put yourself into, right? Uh, that's that's really that's really I think that's really what life is about, especially in the professional world. Yeah, and, and that's a, a really good point because the larger companies, they tend to have training programs anyway. Yeah. And unless it's, uh, as you said, engineering or some IT development skills, you're very good with SAP or some big software package, then you have a minimum skill set. I mean, someone once mentioned that if you actually uh, match every single job requirement, in the listing, you're overqualified. So yeah. you, you, if you've done all of those things, then <laughs> yeah. you should definitely leave some room for growth. And um, the uh, conclusion here, I guess, uh, is um, the geographical arbitrage. Right? So people will have very specific skills in the Ugandan market, and they have the network and have uh, everything uh, developed there over many years in a specific yeah. industry or multiple industries. But what about getting Ugandan teenagers to or young adults to start working in virtual jobs uh, in other countries? Because you guys speak English really well. So that's not a, a, a constraint. Do you have companies that are already doing that, like offering jobs to 18 to 25 year olds uh, so that they can um, you know, work virtually for companies in other countries? Well, there's not many, but uh, funny you should mention that <clears throat> I did a I did a newspaper inter uh, uh, interview probably about two weeks ago, and I was literally mentioning the same thing, right? Uh, business process outsourcing, because if you look at um, China, India, right, that is a huge, huge, um, that's a huge opportunity that I don't think we're tapping into at the moment. And like you said, we have everything. We have the we have uh, English English speaking people. Um, they're uh, fairly educated. Like um, on the on the Brighter Monday platform, we have about two hundred thousand people, wow. and about seventy percent of them have a first degree, right? So it's not like they're not educated, but um, we're we're not being 
very intentional about it uh, because of course this comes with particular standards there's other issues around like saying like with the internet so it's an untapped it's a very very large untapped opportunity that i believe for us to move to be able to sort of leapfrog and, and develop and and most especially employ the youth it's something we should definitely be considering for sure yeah, I mean, one of the ideas that we have in the Wisdom Accelerator is that you accelerate wisdom through experience. Mm. And of course, it's um, very, very challenging for teenagers anywhere in the world to get jobs. And they tend to be walk the dog or mow the lawn and uh, you know do something that is uh, basic and uh, in the immediate proximity of their home. And my question is, why? Is in, you know, there's absolutely no reason other than perhaps local legislation, which could be a concern, yep. that would prevent uh, a 17 years old from Kampala from doing market analysis for a company in Australia. Right? So if you are in a situation, and uh, the concern here could be payment, like how, how do you actually pay for this opportunity? But if you are a teenager, you don't really have so much to offer in terms of experience, Ooh. you have sweat equity, you have your time, and that yep. could be very valuable if you, uh, you know, have that level of maturity. And uh, yep. one of the things we're planning to do, it would be great to hear your opinion on that, is to offer those virtual internship opportunities via the Wisdom Accelerator platform. So we'll be reaching out to companies around the world, and I have already started doing that, asking okay. them, what are the jobs that you have that teenagers will be able to do? As in... Uh, just go to a website and uh, copy all the website pages and create an Excel spreadsheet that then someone from the uh, analytics department uh, can use. That's something really yeah. basic, but it's going to give them also basic but highly relevant skills. And yeah. um, the parents of the teenager will be the supervisors. I mean, they are signing a contract, right? So you, you get obviously a contract which is very flexible. Uh, it should not impact uh, school hours, the commitment that I have to be a good student. But I think that something between four and eight hours a week is uh, adequate for them to start to understand what is expected from them in the labor market to gain some useful skills, even if it's Word, Excel, PowerPoint, or whatever it is. I mean, it could literally be someone is going to give you a, you know, a, a badly done PowerPoint and say, please align all the boxes. I didn't you know, really, you know, teenagers can do that. <laughs> they don't think that yeah. this is a skill at all. And uh, they'll learn how to use PowerPoint, right? That's uh, yeah. a skill worth having. And um, if um, in a month, there are weeks when they're having exams at high school, then it's fine for them to do nothing, but they're still expected to have the 16 hours in total. So four hours a week for four weeks. And then they will be respecting the terms uh, of the uh, engagement. And if they turn 18 and uh, they have the opportunity to actually go there and get paid uh, to work in a proper internship in the company that they're working for because they develop a good relationship, great for them. Like we only want to focus on the teenager part, like making sure that we're opening those doors, at least saying, hey, this is possible. And how come you don't have more people doing that? And I know why, because of liabilities and because the teenagers are still at high school, they cannot sign contracts. But all of those are engineering problems, right? They're solvable. It's not like new science that needs to be discovered. And I would love to have your opinion in terms of this idea and how do you think that you should implement it? Well, first of all, I think that's a fantastic, fantastic thing to do. I think personally, like my kids, when I do have them from like, you know, 10, 11, where, where they're going to start working. And working in the sense where uh, it's from a strategic point of view, it's from the point of view where they are exposed to uh, the right sort of corporate cultures, right? And they're learning the sort of things you're talking about there, Marcelo, because that's what happened to me. My dad, from literally like 11, 12, I, I started working with him, right? And it, it shaped me to become who I am now, because now I've been managing people for a very long time, but that's been developed off of having that sort of mentorship very close to me where um, I but I was fortunate enough to have exposure to, to the things you're talking about. Doing it on an international scale would be fantastic. I think um, two hours a day is, is about 10 hours a week. It's not that much time that um, somebody can't uh, do it, right? I also think you could scale it up with time. <clears throat> so the people who are in, say, 
uh, GCE level would have maybe less time. And then as they grow older, right? Um, when they have vac vacations between uh, all levels and A levels, you could they could now sort of walk uh, walk walk through that period, right? Those uh, those long breaks during the summer, they could work some more, right? And then as they get into uh, right before they join university, right, that could be a proper internship that they're doing. Then they continue doing it as well, just after slightly after the teenage um, age, right, when they get to uni, it would be something where you've built. Uh, you've built uh, those skills and that exposure by working for, say, different companies you're interested in over a long period of time, right? So when you come out of uni, you don't have gaps in your CV. And you have a level of experience, of experience and exposure. So I think it's a fantastic idea. I'm happy to actually help. Well, that, that. that would be great because you, you have not only the personal experience in doing that because of uh, your family giving you that, that chance, but you're also working in the space. And it would be great maybe to have a pilot uh, with uh, teenagers from Uganda, right? To just you know, set up some sort of structure. Um, and I will definitely need your support in terms of understanding Ugandan law because we don't want to break into laws in the process of doing this. Of yeah. course, the parents are the ones saying that we are completely okay with this. And the yeah. whole point is, if you are in a situation where you did two or three of those internships, right? Over a period of three months, my idea is having three months is a minimum because right. from a teenager's perspective, this is a really long commitment. It's like, wow, right. I'll do something for three months <laughs> for the first time in my life. Yeah. Uh, extendable to six months. And uh, during the summer months, if they want to do something directly, if it's uh, allowed, right? It needs to be legal, of course. Uh, but uh, yeah. if it's uh, something that they want to do during the summer months of working full time and getting paid for that, fantastic, right? I'm happy for them. But so the, uh, the main point of what we're trying to do is to make sure that they can claim, uh, rightly so, uh, in their university application forms, I've worked for Johnson and Johnson and Nokia and Microsoft, and yeah, it was only you know uh, one hour a day. Uh, but it's like, wow, no, you understand enough to be able to get this kind of positions. And I think the universities would be absolutely delighted to yeah. consider those profiles and give them priority compared to um, others. And my follow-up question on that one is that how did you manage to go to the UK? What was your process to be accepted and selecting universities and all that? Mm, um, so. I don't know if you know how well you know the UK education structure, but you have uh, there's uni there's old universities like Edinburgh, and then there is uh, the newer universities like the one I went to for 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 undergrad, uh, Middlesex. Um, it wasn't too difficult to get in for undergrad, but for my masters, I was literally the only African in my class, right? And there were about four Africans in the whole business in the whole business school in my year. Which was a lot, a lot tougher because you had to have, you had to show up with your grades, right? And it was super challenging. Um, again, that's another thing that really shaped me. You know, I would actually encourage anyone who's able to do uh, postgraduate education to do it on a full time basis because, man, the pressure, like the, it, 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 it shapes you. It definitely shapes something, something inside you. So for the 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 more prestigious um, universities, you definitely have to be a, a high performer to get in there. Yeah, and uh, did you have someone from your family helping out, saying, "Oh, you should uh, go to Middlesex, or you should go to Edinburgh"? Or what yeah. was the election process to uh, you know, identify those? So um, I had a cousin who was in London at the time for undergrad. Um, uh, who helped me out with the applications and stuff. Uh, but these days, it's much easier, at least from here, because uh, you, uh, there's a there's there's a number of people who do this uh, from a career advice perspective, right? At that time, there were not that many, right? So I needed a bit of guidance in terms of what I wanted to do. What I I knew for a fact that I wanted to do was business related, right? So that I knew at the back of my mind because I've always been good at numbers, and I, I figured uh, I might as well stay the course and sort of learn uh, the, the you know the business aspects and apply or utilize my skill with numbers, right? Um, for my masters, it was a completely different thing that I, I almost did by myself uh, because after doing accounting, I realized I didn't want to be an accountant, but I was still fascinated by finance, you know, financial markets, trading, Wall Street, right? And so I, I did a bit of research. I went online, you know, um, I looked at the Times rankings and then for finance in particular, the Financial Times ranks business schools um, 
for, for their MBAs, first of all, and then the fi finance related degrees. So what I found was that Edinburgh's, Edinburgh's um, uh, I, did, I did an MSc in finance and investment, and it was among the top 20 uh, pre-finance qualifications in the world. So that's sort of what shaped my mind to, to, to go there, as well as Edinburgh's um, history by itself. I mean, they've been in existence from the 1800s, right? Early 1800s. So the culture, it was, it was, they were like two completely different um, experiences, really. Yeah, and the, it's also a fun city uh, to yeah. live in, right? Edinburgh has a festival and uh, everything else. And um, I am surprised you don't have a Scottish accent. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, you, you managed to escape from that. No? Uh, I did. Oh. And the weather was, well, something else. It was yeah. terrible. Oh, but uh, you see, by comparison, you knew that you could go back to Kampala and then it was just uh, you know, a That's period true. of your life. So it, it doesn't hit you as hard as people who say, hey, you no, know, this is where I'm going to be spending the rest of my days. And they dream of yeah. holidays in Greece or Spain. And yeah. uh, you know, they are uh, less likely to be happy and satisfied. So I think sure. that the, the international experience that you had is really fantastic. And yeah. I'm happy that uh, you are in a position now to help others, um, you know, even if it's just by giving feedback to people in a platform saying that, look, you know, if you have an international experience, it's much easier to uh, find a job for you. And uh, yeah. I don't know what else you guys are doing, but uh, I'm based in Switzerland, right? So I uh, never okay. worked uh, with the uh, ring gear, but I know that they're okay. a big uh, company. I'm happy that they're involved in the uh, Ugandan market. Yes, thank you very much, Gusalo. Uh, it's been uh, quite... Um insightful really and yeah i'm looking forward just reach out and we can take it from there